Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 86 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And let me introduce our incredible guest for today, Chris Tanto Peranto, who's going to be answering our questions today. Chris, welcome aboard the Talk 4 podcast, brother. Please just, you know, say hi to the fine people listening and just give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do. And then we'll shoot some questions, man. Louis, hey man, it's an honor, buddy. And thank you for all your listeners out there. If they're listening to this or watching my ugly face, man, God bless y'all. I appreciate I appreciate it. But uh, my name's Chris. Uh, I, my call sign was Tonto. Some of you may know the story background. I was an Army Ranger uh, for several years, and then I worked with the CIA's Global Response Staff, as well as other contracting companies uh, and contracting missions around the world. Um, the name Tonto, if you know it, you probably know it from the movie 13 Hours. Uh, it was a Michael Bay movie that came out in a book of the same name, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, where my team and myself uh, tried to rescue an ambassador, and Sean's and an IT IT a person from the State Department, Sean Smith and Christopher Stevens. And in that rescue mission, we got left behind, and we I lost two of my teammates, Tyron Woods and Glenn Doherty, former Navy SEAL. So that may be where you know it, and it may be from some of my pages out there, but. That's me in a nutshell, buddy. And I'm just an old man, grouchy, that's just uh, living in the Midwest. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. And um, yeah, look, dude, I just want to lead with just how proud and honored I am to have you here. You know, reading up on you, watching the movie, listening to you. It makes me a truly proud American, which is funny because I'm 100% British, which is odd, I suppose. But yeah, I feel it, man. And I'm just so honored to have you here. You're a legend, Thanks, dude. Man. <laughs> Thanks, Louie. And I, I ain't no legend. I served with two of them. And man, I got to watch those guys, you know, especially Ronan and Bub and several others throughout the 10 years of my deploying in global war on terror. Many, 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 many legends, many, many heroes that I got to serve with and that are no longer with us. But man, it showed me what the true meaning of heroism is. So but thank you. Thank you for saying that. And and again, it's an honor. And it's always wonderful to get 13 hours out there in Benghazi out there. So nobody forgets that, even though here are some people in our country want that to go away but mm. with shows like yourself it never will absolutely man well that's the that's the mission like i said at the start it's unique and interesting people you've got a great story to tell and i can't wait to dig Thank into you. it so man question one let's rewind a bit then so kind of take me through your backstory you know where are you from why did you want to join sure. the military in the first place and just kind of guide us into becoming a ranger and passing <laughs> selection yeah, I, I never really wanted to be in the military. And I read a lot of books growing up. I, I loved reading what we have books in America from the Vietnam Rangers. They were called Charlie Ranger books and they were the LERP teams. And I read those all the time. The Long Range Reconnaissance Patrols are really cool. They're called hunter killer teams. So, you know, as a kid growing up I'm, and I'm growing up in, in small town America and like, man, that's cool. I'm going to be in the army. But I kind of thought, forgot about that high school and college because I was in athletics. And we talked about that before we started recording. You know, both of us are athletes. I played football, had a scholarship to to college, and I, I was going to go play football. But when you're short and you're slow, the NFL is not going to be calling you here in America. <laughs> so um, the army just worked out that way. I was I just happened to see an army recruiter during the final days of my graduation there uh, at uh, Colorado Mesa University. And he just called me over and basically, I think he suckered me in. Recruiters are awesome. Military recruiters are fantastic here in America. And he's like, hey, man, come see these cool videos. And there was a Ranger video. Then there was a Navy guy right next to him. So I got to see the SEAL video. And then uh, and then the Marine guys were there. So there's a Force Recon, which are now the Raiders or Marsoc. And I just like, I liked, I'll be honest, I like the beret. I liked the Rangers. I liked the scroll. I, I liked that it was difficult. They all were difficult, but it just, I don't know. The army just kind of said, that's, that's that route. And I signed up and um, yeah, so got my bachelor's degree, graduated college. And then all of a sudden I'm enlisting in the army, which really isn't the route. Usually you enlist so you can come to college. And, and then I just went in the army. And um, the first time I was in Louie, I'll be, I, you know, a lot of people that have read the Ranger way, I have a book. I wrote the Ranger way after 13 hours. I actually got thrown out of the military the first time I was in. They didn't realize it. I just think I went straight through. No, actually I got in trouble. And for sake of time, I won't go into it. You can read the book if you want to read the Ranger <laughs> way. But I, I got thrown out. And actually, I, that's where I went to grad school for two years. And luckily for me, God bless, you know, somebody, God's looking down on me. I did manage to get an honorable discharge. I didn't deserve it, but I got it the first time I was out. So after those two years of me going to grad school, I, you know, I, when when you're a special ops or anything, 
you don't quit. And and I was like, man, I cannot let this, this, it was hanging over me. You know, the army, I, I cannot let that be what happened to me in the army. So I'm 20 years from now and I didn't do what I was set out to do. So I reenlisted back in, went back in infantry. I did it all over again. I did infantry airborne. I did Ranger all over again and um, went to Ranger school, you know, Ranger school sucks. The stories of Ranger <laughs> school are spot on. If you know about me, we don't eat, we don't sleep. It's just miserable, but hell of an experience and i went through in the winter time so i froze my balls off as well which was miserable um but managed to get there and and in my life you know after after you get through that and i've got back through in the military uh things just took off i actually became a commissioned officer so for getting kicked out of the military to being a must what we call a mustang uh enlisted time became a sergeant then i became a commissioned officer and then uh and then i got sick with crohn's disease and damn near killed me and I had to get medically discharged. Again, you know, life just takes these weird turns. And I thought, well, shit, you know, here's my life. I, this was my career was to go to Delta Rangers, then go be an officer in Delta. That's not going to happen. And right around that time is when contracting, uh, paramilitary contracting started to get big. You know, Blackwater, Triple Canopy. You know, you guys had Olive Group there in the UK, which was a big company at the time. Uh, Control Risk Group, Edinburgh Risk, which was a big, big uh, British company as well, coming out. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of South African companies. And I got in at that ground level. I got a phone call, I sick as hick as hell, and they said, "Hey, we got your name from another ranger. Do you want to be a contractor?" I didn't know what that was. But then they explained it to me, and I was like, "Well, shit, yeah, I, I, I'm not doing." anything and they, i remember they said are you well are, are you okay are you, you you healthy enough to go because and I, I wasn't but we didn't have to go through med checks back for a contract engager a private citizen so i said <laughs> yeah i'm good and i just loaded up on prednisone and and mesalamine anti-inflammatories and i went through their vetting course in, in moyoc in 2003 and then i was shipped off and that's where that's where the contracting roles took off and that's where it led to grs working with the cia and libya you know almost 10 11 years later wow man i mean that just is the roller coaster isn't it it was it's just <laughs> it is it is it's tremendous but it taught me intestinal fortitude it taught me the ups and downs and and you know it really does that's it was preparing all that little stuff there was preparing me for you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the stuff I went through in the 10 years where I worked in Baghdad and Kabul and Kandahar, Mosul, or, you know, I worked in Yemen, I fought pirates off the coast of Somalia. Mm -hmm. I got to do a lot of cool stuff. But then, you know, also in Libya, we had a lot of ups and downs. So, yeah, I said, the, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Yeah, I, I am a Christian. I'm not going to get into it with, I think people need to find their own paths, whatever. But I, I do think a lot of that was preparing me so when that night happened i was like well mm. you know i know the roller coaster ride let's just keep pushing through it and we'll, we'll get through it and we're going to win this fight whatever it is universe stuff man you know it's 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 bigger than us and it knows what it's doing and um yeah yes sir well man look so obviously cia security contractor then so kind of just walk me through like what that kind of involved and just kind of tell me how you ended up winding up in Benghazi because, you know, when we look at the movie, you're already there. So, like, how yeah. did you kind yeah. of, how did that come about, if you will? Well, if, you, if we can start from the ground floor, and and like I said, we should we probably have to go longer than forty minutes because I I talk my ass off here. <laughs> um, but but um, you you do when when at least in the beginning when where contracting was going, you couldn't just apply for jobs. It was a recommendation, or you know, there wasn't like. Like, hey, go on the CI website. There's the secure, which now you can. Now there's actually websites and contracting where they're, you, you can you can do a job search and it's going to pop up. But it was I'd done two years in Iraq for the State Department and I'd done quite well under their high threat protection program, which was the Bremer program. And then after that and the CI was doing some programs and they started to hand cherry pick guys and. Uh, one of my program managers from Blackwater, who was a former dev group guy, still team six guy, he says, Hey, do you want to go try out for this CIA program? And I'm like, well, yeah, what does it entail? And he said, well, it's really tough. Only about 25% make it. And I, I know, I, I know you're the same way being an athlete. You're like, hell yeah, it's a challenge. Okay, let's go do it. And yeah, after that time going through a lot, being a ranger and all that, you know, going through the vetting processes of, uh, of even when I was a 19 special forces group, yeah, it's like, okay, trials to try. It's going to suck. So what? It can't suck as worse as Ranger School. It can't suck as worse than Ranger Indoctrination. Ranger, or now it's called RASP, but Ranger Indoctrination. It can't suck worse than that. But 
if I don't know and I don't try, then I'm not going to succeed regardless. So I went and I did it and it was tough. It was a, it was a three week course of vetting, a vetting course to become a GRS operator, which is what I was in Benghazi. And this was 2006, 2005, 2006. And, uh, and passed it. A lot of shooting. It, it was it was a humbling experience because fifty percent of our class made it. And you got to remember this: everybody there was either Delta SEAL, uh, combat controller, pararescue, ranger, marshal. I mean, these are guys that know how to shoot that have been in the military. And actually, some of them, you know, I've already been down range for a couple of years. So it was intense, but man, it was fun. And you know, this is the thing where I told you about Mo and Mick before we came on the show about all you guys from the SAS, uh, MI6, MI5. Are all, two of our instructors were MI6 and MI5 guys that, that we, you know, CIA and MI, they collaborated. And yeah, they were named Mo and Mick. Great guys. Great, great. Just the most even keeled dudes. I love those guys. But the process was very difficult. They were both former SAS and and then S, uh, SBS, small small boat and small and then uh, special boat service, special air taxes, air service tax guys, SAS and SBS, and they were they really put us through the grinder. But once you get through that, then you start going out on these little clandestine small group protection ops, which is what GRS is. But it's more than that. It's you know it's picking up weapon systems. It's it's doing reconnaissance, small team reconnaissance, which is really cool. It's living on the economy. So all these places we go, you know, there are some where we live maybe in a clandestine base, but we're not living on an army base or anything like that. We're or we're living in a house in the city. So what was so awesome is that you got to live on the economy. So if I'm in Kabul or if I'm in Kandahar or even Mosul or Benghazi, or when I was in Sanaa, Yemen, you know, I'm going out and having coffee. In town. I mean, you really are on your own. And I'm not going to say it's James Bond type stuff. Cause there's no James Bond type stuff. That's like James Bond in the movies, but <laughs> it, it's fun because you really are, I mean, you're on your own. I mean, I got to go get something to eat. I'm going down to the local, local habab, you know, local kebab shop to get some food. I'm going to go get the mystery meat. I get coffee. And, and granted, that was good. The coffee every in all these countries was magnificent. But it, it really was eye opening to the fact, not just the missions. The missions were fun. The missions were fantastic. They were they were very high threat, but very high. They're very dangerous. But I got to know the people. And that was what was cool. That was what I thought was so neat is that. I wasn't living on an army base and I had to go on ops in a uniform. I just dressed like a local and I go out and, and, and I go to the bazaars, I go to the markets and, and, and that's what I loved about the job. And you could get the atmospherics, what was going around in the city, which is in Benghazi, which is kind of what, you know, the movie, we tried to get that. It's hard to do, but you saw us when we went out and did that little dinner and restaurant meet in the beginning of 13 hours, you know, that was still an op, but we did that a lot on our own. We just go out and try to pick up surveillance so yeah. we could do counter surveillance it was just it was just it was just fun and exciting because there was only usually two of you maybe four of you at the most and sometimes you're all by yourself and you know to me that was what was fun it's like man if, if stuff hit the fan if the shit hit the fan you're hey that's it it's just you guys and you know i, I think the movie actually did a good job showing that because when the shit did have the hit the fan now we didn't think we'd be left behind but when the shit did hit the fan it was it was just us and and hey we roll with it that's just how it goes and and i think we did an excellent job and they did a great job showing that in 13 hours but uh that's just a taste i mean it really that is just a small taste of what the job actually is and that's why it was so exciting and fun and i do i miss it i, I really do miss it wow man well, that's a hell of a story and you know <laughs> think, thinking about um thinking about like life and stuff and kind of you know achieving and just if there was ever like a sign that you've done something seriously cool, I think it would probably be having a movie directed by Michael Bay about <laughs> it. Like, I think yeah. that's probably the sort of like sign that you are a bit of a badass, right? So I, I, um... I, I don't know if I'm bad, <laughs> but it is actually, it is actually really cool. Now to think about it now. Yeah, it, it, that is. That's, and that, what I, but in more things literally than anything, what, what, what I love about it more than anything is that Bob and Roan and Ambo, Chris and Sean, they will forever be immortalized. No matter mm -hmm. what our U.S. media wants to do to try to wash that away, it will never go away. And he did such a great job. And the actors did such a fantastic job portraying us. And the great guys in themselves. Actually, I'm still friends with, with Pablo. I'm still friends with, if I see John, or I'm, I'm, I can say hi. I can say we're buddies or anything. They're in a different, whole different world than me. But it, it, it will forever be immortalized and no matter who tries to sweep it away or sweep it under the carpet, it's never going to go away. 
And that's that that's awesome. And I appreciate you saying that because mm-hmm. because you're right. You're right. It is it is freaking cool to be in a be portrayed in a Michael Bay movie by Pablo Schreiber, who did an excellent, excellent job uh, with portraying me. And actually, him and I are still friends. We got to know each other very, very well. And uh, and I still consider him a friend. He still considers me a friend. And um, but as you, if you ever meet me in person, brother, you come in the Midwest and shoot with me, you'll see he is a hell of a lot bigger than me. He's huge. I am a little short, five, nine, 175 pound dude. That's it. He's like my monster. So, so that's, I don't look like that in real life. Just, just so everybody just full disclosure <laughs> here. I, I don't look like that huge dude that's on the movie. Oh my God, dude, that would be insane. I mean, like if we could go shoot and, you know, see that oh, guy too, that would be just insane. But look, man, so you got to go me through this then because, you know, you're not just like your average dude. You, you're a, full character of a person and you know it must be difficult to kind of get that accurate from an actor or something you know everything from the yeah. you know no head to the you know to, to all of the you stuff all the, the, you know, the dancing with the flashlights take? i love it was that accurate that, yeah yeah actually i danced a lot i i buddy i lmfo I, I i if you can if hope what i was trying to get pablo to capture uh, and we we did no we we he got to know let me start on the movie far first. I have a lot more respect for actors now after that movie than before I did hmm. for, because they really did put their heart and soul into trying to get our person, not just the acting, right? Not just the shooting and the movements, which looks, they did a great job going through all the tactical movements, just the personalities. Correct. They put a lot of time and effort into just getting to know us. At least Pablo did with me. Um, and no, so no the the dancing with the flashlights the lmfo stuff which i used to listen to i used to listen to ricky martin as well i i did everything i could to parody the badass the badass uh badass uh i guess the personalities that used to, the alpha male the tough i i always was the opposite of that because there were too many there were too many of, of those meatheads out there knuckle draggers out there and I, I i couldn't stand that and you i just want you didn't have to be a knuckle dragger to be able to get in a fight and kick some butt you can mm. still be a joker. You can still dance with flashlights and you can still go to put La Bamba on the radio and drive down the street if you wanted to. And I used to do that in Cabo all the time too. put on Ricky Martin and all these Cabo people and not much for clandestine <laughs> mm. being clandestine, but it it was, it was those, those little things that, uh, that I think a lot of the other movies didn't capture that you did in ours. And it was just the, just the various personalities and the joking around and, and the wearing the shorts. Yeah. I still got those shorts. Of course I, that was a movie. I, I had the, that's what I was wearing. I mean, w- w- big deal. I, the shorts. I, the only thing we couldn't put in the movie, which I wish we would have is, is I had a, a, a Mickey mouse shirt on. They just, Disney wouldn't let us put the movie. And that's why ah. we watch the movie again. The closest thing you, we could find was a panda shirt. So that's why Pablo's wearing that panda shirt. But yes, the, uh, the the movie was extremely accurate and the actors took their time to get all those little mannerisms down the the, the smart ass comments that i always i i still have those yes that's spot on the the hey talking to the cia case when i came back and i, I you know I, I and and little amal which his real name's henry little amal um you know he gives the gun back and i gotta go get my pistol back from him because we're back at the annex and the guys and i remember the guy he's like hey what's going on i was like no i did say can i can i cuss i don't Louis, can you beep this out <laughs> in, the, in the movies in the movie you know pablo says yeah come on check it out come on up i'll tell you all about it and that's what i, I said yeah fucking come on up i'll tell you all about it <laughs> you know, being a smart ass to these jason bournes that were all over the place at that time that's something i was hoping pablo i said dude i i know it may feel wrong because you're you're may feel like you're bad mountain ci people but do it because that's what i did and and he did and just the, just the being being condescending being an arrogant ass but i said once the fight was going on i was in the fight and none of these guys could say otherwise just and i said the rest of the team was in the fight too we had a great team i mean so it wasn't just me believe it, it, i I, if, I wouldn't be talking today if i didn't have tyrone and oz and tig and boone yeah. and everybody else around me but i i think they really captured all that and even the downtime where we're just those lulls that you just it's like a boxing but it's like a tennis match you put that you know you're, you're playing your ass off and then you said you got that break between sets and you're like oh man that's yeah. how it was and, and talking about family and remembering you know the what's the last thing i said to my wife and kids while i'm sitting up on that lawn chair um eating a snickers bar you know, and that's another thing in the movie. I'm glad they got right. They got the Snickers bars. They got the lawn chairs. They got the water. They got us kicking back and be like, 
we're tired. Let's take a break. Okay, let's talk and kind of reevaluate what's going on. And and Jack's talking to Tyrone, going, man, you know, downtime's the worst. You know, this is this is when you think about your family, and that's so spot on because that's what we all were doing. And and so so no, the 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 actors, tremendous job. Uh, I can't say thank you enough. Michael Bay did a tremendous job. We were on set for a lot of it. It was filmed in Malta and Morocco. So we got to be a part of that, which was a, honestly an awesome experience in itself as well. Just being on a, on a Paramount Michael Bay movie set, but then just watching the movie come out. And still to this day, I, I, I cry every time I watch it even more so now, because I can just see how much effort they put into it to get it correct. And I, I still feel those emotions when I'm watching the movie that I was that, that night that maybe I was trying to forget, but that I'll never forget because they'll, you know, they'll always be etched in my brain. Always. They're, they're, so, they're seared in there, man. Everything I saw and everything I smelled and everything yeah. I heard, man, it's, um, you know, movies and, and film production. It, it's, it's another art form. And I think that movie from what you've described truly is a work of art to be able to capture yeah. that. So, cause you know, it's a piece of history. When you think about it, we've always written things in books and we've never really had, like things so accurate but in this case you know when you can capture something that accurately it's really important for our history man and and it's 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 a great movie as well i have to say it but you know third question man um there's kind of two part this then so the movie portrays it really well but when you were there when you were doing that were you just how hard was that mentally man like were you just in the fight were you just in the moment kind yeah. of just thinking about just what's in front of you or was it insanely difficult and the other part of that question i want to put forward as well is when you were making the movie was that very difficult for you to bring up the details and the memories and everything of that time because it was a very traumatic and extreme event or was were you able to kind of leave the past to the past of it yes those are actually two great questions the, the first part um if it would have been earlier in my career, I think it would have been harder. Uh, you know, I think there may have been doubts that crept in because there are always those opportunities for doubts. Like, are we going to get out of here? Um, I don't think it was a coincidence that all of us there that were there that night were all senior guys that had all been downrange many, many times, had all served with our various branches for many years um, because we all were it, – it, it's, it's like – and I, and I'm using, you know, I'm using this comparison because, because of your game, but it's like a tennis game that just keeps going. I mean, yeah. you don't, is this going to end? It's just, is are just going to keep going until it's done? And that was the mindset of everybody. It was just, it was, no, they're going to keep coming. We'll keep killing them till they, until they stop or until we finally find a way out of here. Um, I think I really, the, 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 where, where we got over the hump where it was, okay, this is it. We're just going to keep fighting. And if it doesn't matter if we ran out of ammo and I'm have to start pull and we're going to have to go hand in hand with knives, it's just how it's going to go. Um, it was around three o'clock when we realized after multiple calls to various units in the area that were supposed to come help us, whether it was the 555th fighter wing, which is F- F-16s out of Viano and Suda Bay, um, whether it was the, the fast company Marines that were in Sigonella, there was one floating in the Mediterranean as well. There was the 10 special forces group, which is the commanders in the extremist force, which was, which was got, got repositioned down to Sigonella from Spain. You had Delta flying in, uh, trying to get over to us from the United States. When we realized that that was so far behind and then those that were coming were told to stop, that's, I think, is when we're like, well, what can you do? You know, mm. fuck, you know fuck it. You know, let's just keep fighting. Um, so no, I, 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 there was, there was one time at around 5.00 AM before the mortars hit where a sun, you know, the sun's going to come up sooner. I like, well, crap, if they get over these walls, it's, it's, it's hand to hand. And that, that's a different mindset. I, I, not, not saying that shooting, but shooting is, is a little bit impersonal. I mean, it, it's, you're killing somebody. Yes. And, but knifing some and getting up and close that's a different mindset it, even it I, I know it may sound hard and people oh, what a, you're a war, i'm not a warmonger guys i don't want to kill anybody i i didn't ask to do this i i didn't ask for them to come and attack us but it is a different mindset and you do have to change your mindset a little bit especially when there's a law when it, now when you're in the fight and it's just going on you just react you just do it it's you do your habit form your moves you do what you're trained the 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 uh the you know the the words of people say you just you just go into your your instinct i don't believe in instincts because instinct tells me your brain's not thinking your brain's always thinking your muscles don't think your brain thinks but you go into these habitual movements and you just do it 
I think the hardest part is when we, those lulls in between, when you actually have a chance to think and, and you don't want, <laughs> you don't want to go down those, those, those demon dark holes of what could happen. So what I would do is I was like, okay, well, what, if they do do this, what is my reaction? If they jump over this wall, what do I need to do? I call it war gaming. Mm -hmm. Some guys call it what ifing in their head. If they hit us with this, what am I going to do there? And the only way you can keep your mind occupied with that is the immense amount of training and also the experience because you, either you've gone through before in training, you've gone through that that episode in training of either an ambush or a mortar attack or a rocket attack or they're jumping over the walls or they're hitting you with a PKM or or you've gone through it before. And again, that's why I said the, the seniority of the group, all of us had either been through something similar for real or been through it many times in training. So it wasn't hard to pull ourselves away from that we're not going to make it out of here. It was, okay, what do I do if this happens? And I honestly, I think that's the way people should go in life in anything. It's like, Hey, don't think of the worst thing can happen. Think of what could happen. Yeah, it might be bad, but how do I get out of it? Or how do I win the fight? How do I win every little fight? How do I win every little point? How, it's you know, that athletics. I think athletics and honestly, special operations, especially on the pro level, they, they coincide pretty close to how do you win this game? Well, it's the same thing. It's just the ultimate game. Your, your, your life's in the line, but how do I win this fight? And I got to win every freaking point and it may go on forever, but you continue to fight until you win. You, you, you know, you never stop fighting. Yeah. So that, and I had a team of guys that felt the same way. We never let that negativity creep in. If some guy did, I never knew about it. It was okay. What do we do next? Okay. Those assholes are coming at us again. What are we going to do here? All right. Well, I'm going to shoot this way. You shoot that way. A grenade comes over. I got you covered. You go get, I, I'll, if the tick goes down, you go triage him. I'll continue to cover you. It, it just was, yeah. It, it was beautiful, dude. It was like a Mozart. It was like an, it was like Mozart. It was like an orchestra just <laughs> playing. So, and that was that I get chills talking about it because I've been on a lot of teams, but only one other time in Kandahar was I ever on a team where it just felt like it didn't matter what we did. We all knew what we were going to do and we we're going to get out of it. Yeah. Um, but the second part of your question on the movie, well, so, so anyway, no, I never felt the negativity, like shit, we're going to lose. It was no, we're going to get out of here. We'll figure it out. I don't care if we fight till, till, till next month, we're going to figure out a way on your other, on the movie, the movie at first was not hard because it was cool being, it was something new. I'd never been on a movie set. I'd never been in Malta either, even though Malta is right across from Libya, that little island, I'd never been there. And I'd never been around, you know, like, like I said, a Michael Bay, Paramount, huge movie set. So that was cool initially because it was a new experience. But as it went and we, you know, Mike, Michael would turn to us during a scene and he'd say, oh, hey, Tano, what'd that look like? Did Pablo do that right? Hey, Oz, did, did Max do that right? It did start to bring back memories especially when they were doing the scene where we got hit at the consulate it was really the first counterattack, and an rpg came in and knocked me on my ass to the wall um now pablo he turned around was shooting our mark my mark 46 and he had his hand in the wrong position so i told mike i said michael hey mr mr bay I, i'm still very respectful military <laughs> to me he goes no I just but i said hey pablo's hand was in the wrong position when he hit that charging handle it was palm was down his palm needs to be up or you're, i told him i said you're gonna lose every ranger in the audience because that's not right tactically so they made him refilm it which is a kudos to michael it was it was awesome that they refilmed the whole attack scene because pablo's hand was in the wrong spot on that mark 46 but when it was over yeah i i i, I had some issues um i walked off to the side i got some coffee and it 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 bothered it you know, honestly, look at me now. It's kind of how I was. I was just, this is how, when I, when I start to get a little agitated or I start to remember, you know, I'll grab my hand and I'll, I, I even know what I do now because I'm a public speaker. So mm -hmm. I have to relive it a lot, but uh, I do this. And and then um, when they showed the first, what we call a sizzle reel, which is like a trailer for, for the studio. And they did a lot of the filming. We'd been there for two weeks in Malta. They'd already done their stuff in Morocco that they needed. Uh, they showed the sizzle reel, which is, like I said, it's a trailer for the, for the studio. Um, I remember I broke down. Yeah. I got angry. I broke down. I threw my water bottle against one of the walls. And I remember Michael Bay and Pablo turned to me and, and the rest of the actors, all the other actors were all staying around and everybody's like, cause it was awesome. It was a incredible trail. I was like, wow. But it reminded me so much of what happened. And it reminded me of when the mortars hit Oz and, I mean, the mortars hit Oz and Ron and Bub because I was shooting over their heads when they hit. Um, 
yeah, they all thought I was pissed off because they thought the trailer was wrong. And Pablo came up to me because I walked away. I remember I turned and I walked away from everybody because I was starting to cry. Yeah. You can't cry in front of the you can't cry in front of the ladies, man. Come on, man. That's it. It ain't the woke society yet, man. I got I got to maintain my alpha male. <laughs> um, so I walked away because um, I was starting to cry. And Pablo, Pablo's such a great guy. He really is. He ran over and he put his. You know, he's six three, two fifty, dude. He puts. I mean, he's about two twenty five. He puts his arms around me. Huge. He goes up. Uh, he goes, was that, he goes, what'd we do wrong? What'd we do wrong? I said, no, dude, it was perfect. I said, it just, it really hit me, dude. And uh, so, yeah, the movie, that's why I said, I I, I really, I, honestly, I get all that, I get that way with the movie a lot now. Um, But that point and during the filming really hit me hard. It did. Yeah. It did. Um, But it was also, and I remember I went up to Michael Bay after I said, I apologize for walking away, man. You, you did awesome. You hit the nail on the head. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I just, it just, it just brought back a quick memory that really hit me hard, which, and I said, and that just means that you're doing it right. And I remember saying that to him, I said, you're doing it right. So keep doing it. So yeah, but I, I, you know, it, and, and the movie still has that effect on me um, more so at other times than more so sometimes than others, but still every time I watch it, I'll, I'll either break down or at the very least I'll get choked up and, and the, the tear ducts will start coming at certain scenes in there because it, 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 it i'll just remember they did so well it will just bring back i'll yeah. bring the smells the sights everything yeah man i that's i really feel for you dude and you know i'd like to attack two points there actually and before we move into the last question so you know when you, what you were saying about part one it's interesting but i think it's very easy for viewers and kind of non-military people to how do i put this i think it's very easy for, for them to just see the kind of how traumatic it is and how extreme it is, but just from their own perspective. The truth is actually, I think people can almost underestimate slightly just how well-trained you guys are, like in the US military. It's incredible yeah. how how well-trained you guys are for so many years to deal with these things. So then you can actually, you are trained to handle this situation. It's like, you know, yeah. I'm an aviator at heart, man, and I love the fighter jet stuff. And, you know, I follow it all very closely and I listen to the air-to-air -air engagements often. And I've found from listening to some of them that actually when they're in the dog fights and stuff, they're very calm. They are very calm. And the noise over the That's... radios is very, very calm when there is noise. And when they're talking and stuff, that's when something has gone really wrong. But actually oh. these guys, they are <laughs> yep. messed up. They know what's going to happen. If it happens, they're, they're 15 steps ahead of the problems happening. They know what they're going to do if this happens. And they know what's going to happen if that happens. That doesn't, you know, the, these guys it's, are. It, that's it's it. It's spot military. on, bud. It, yeah. it is. It's, it's it's the war gaming. It's and that's mm. this pilots. To me, it's pilots are special operations guys too, as far as I'm concerned. And believe me, any person that's on the ground, we want to hear a pilot come. We want to hear they're, they're coming. <laughs> All right, the angels are coming. But you're so spot on. And and you know, speaking of that, and as far as the calmness, I equate it to everything slows down. I remember that. I remember when all that took place and sorry about that, bud. No worries, man. That's my wife. That's my wife. She's got the, I love me, sex me. I love me, sexy ring, ring tone. When she texts me <laughs> yeah, from, from, uh, from Tropic, from Tropic Thunder, greatest, one of the greatest, I mean, not Tropic Thunder, um, uh, semi-pro with Will Ferrell. Right. But anyway, the, um, you know, what happens is, is it, it does. It, it's when you're under duress and you've got, the experience you've got the age you've got the, the training that all of us have the world slows down and honestly it, the world opens up I, I equate it to like being a racehorse and you have the blinders on and when combat or something traumatic where you're under dress starts those blinders come off and i think that's why it is hard for a lot of us to come back and just be normal because we want those blinders to come off all the time because the world just is so much brighter and clearer and you being a pilot yeah, and the first of the fighter pods, that's exactly what they're saying. It, 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 everything opens up, everything kind of slows down, but it does take a special, not a special person, just a person that's had a lot of special training and been through a lot of 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 traumatic experiences or have been under duress a lot and being able to handle mm -hmm. them. But when we have the quiet time is when it's the hardest. That's yeah. the hardest for me is when it's when it's just quiet, even though I want it now because I'm 52 and I love I love. I love the peace. There are times the demons will creep in. So I, I when it, when it is quiet, but I, I've, I've 
figured out how to handle them. At least I think I have so far. At least I've done it so far. We'll, we'll see for the another 10 years if I'm able to handle them. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, well, I'll tell you what, dude. I mean, this leads really well into my fourth question. Um, so it's a, it's a big one. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you say about this, man. So, you know, in life, shit happens, right? You know, bad yeah. things happen. It's just the degree of it that changes. And um, one thing, uh, a great man and um, a truly amazing soul of a human being who I got to speak to on the podcast, Tyler Gray, he's in the SEAL team at the moment. He's a veteran. You know, he he's a, an A-class person. And, you know, he kind of went along the line of saying, you know, that these bad things that happen, when you look back at them, actually, they sometimes are good things and that they actually yeah. sometimes lead to the current growth unless it leads to death obviously that's an exception but yeah you know they can lead to just leveling up as human beings and these oh, experiences yeah. sometimes are so profound so my last question man is in that night of trauma pain fighting and uncertainty is there a silver lining to it dude uh you know what are some of the biggest take-homes and lessons that you left Benghazi with and if there was a way that the movie or the book or just the story could deliver a lesson or a message to the watchers and readers what would you want them to take away for it that could be life, life impacting well tyler's a smart dude and you know he's 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 spot on uh, really spot on no it, uh, adversity you know I, I think that's one thing that that special operators learn to handle it's adversity how to handle failure we there's not one of us especially that have been in the special operations community that has not failed that's what we do we fail all <laughs> all the time we're but we always pick ourselves up and we always work harder and we learn from those failures so we don't replicate them. We, at least we try to we try to learn from what we do most of the time. Um, Benghazi in itself. And, and I, I, I've told a lot of people this, like I said, I do a lot of public speaking and I talk about it on my, on my podcast. I have a, I have a podcast that that's all it's about is about overcoming adversity. It's called battle line podcast. And I know I'm doing a shameless plug there, but, but what I've learned is that Benghazi is a silver lining in itself because it is dealing with adversity. It's overcoming. And we talked about in the beginning, that roller coaster ride that prepped me for Benghazi because Benghazi was a roller coaster ride. Every time that we were faced with an obstacle that could have stopped us or literally killed us, we're like, nope, this isn't going to stop us. We're going to figure out a way over it or through it or around it. We just kept moving forward. Um, and we got through that night. Yes, we lost four people. It's war. I mean, I, I I wish we always liked to bat a thousand, but it, it's it's war. It doesn't always happen that way. But we still saved over two dozen lives. You know, twenty. I want to say it's twenty six to be exact. And um, so we did succeed, and we found a way out there, even though we didn't get much help from our own U.S. government. Which to me, that's unheard of. You know, finding a way to get all those people out of there. Now we not just us. We all were a team. Even even the, some of the CI people really did a great job getting us help out of there. But we didn't quit. We didn't stop fighting. We didn't give up. Uh, and Benghazi is. It's it's. If I can sum up Benghazi in in one word, I would say adversity. Uh, well, a lot of adverse things happened that night. Did we stop? No. We kept fighting. We got over and we got through them. And, and we can do that in anything in life as long as we just control our attitudes. You know, that's one thing we have control of in our life. It's our own attitudes. Okay. Are we going to give up or are we going to continue to fight on? No, let's continue to fight. Let's continue to give us options. So that's where we do the war gaming. Okay. What do we need to do? Let's figure these things out. Let's keep trying different things to try to succeed and get our way out of here. And then once it does happen, you can look back and you're successful, which I do think Benghazi is successful for, on, on my, uh, from, from my perspective, I can look back and like, oh my gosh, man, we fought through all that. Now, if I face something down the line in my life, I can get through that as well. <laughs> yeah, it's and, hard and, to and, um, hard to beat that, isn't it? <laughs> that is, and that's that's you, you can learn from every traumatic experience. You get through it. If you're faced with that trauma again, you've already conquered it. So I have conquered it. I can do it again. And and, and uh, you know, Louis, I've talked about this before, um, but I have. I, I it did bring me down to some some dark places. I had three years of my life after Benghazi when the movie came out that. I was a mess. You know, I was drinking. I was divorced from my, my wife. I, you know, I was standing there out there, talked to relationship with every girl I could find. It was miserable. And I, I did, I, I did put a gun in my mouth uh, twice, actually. I thought about once killing us. I did. And then mm -hmm. two other times I almost did it. But what saved me, it was Benghazi. It was, I mean, my kids, of course, my, my, my wife, which I reconcile with, but it was 
really looking and going, okay, you went through hell on earth. You fought like hell to get back in the military, doing everything again. You did all that 10 years prior. Then my God, it happened. And you didn't give up then. And now you're going to give up on yourself. So even in my own life, Benghazi is an example of, hey, you just don't quit. No matter how low you get, you can get through it because you don't give up. And 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 I didn't give up. And I didn't give up on myself where I should have, where I could have, you know, three years after Benghazi. The, the greatest fight of my of all, not just Benghazi, a fight for my soul. Mm-hmm. I didn't give up. And Benghazi helped me get through that. So again, I am a believer, a believer in God. I am. You don't have to believe in God, but I don't think God put me through that with the other guys put us through that for no reason um i honestly for the 10 years that i did before benghazi i probably would have went down that slippery slope regardless benghazi maybe have expedited it but if i didn't get a chance to go through benghazi on that night i don't think i would have pulled myself out of those demon holes that Mm -hmm. i was in and i probably would i I, you know hindsight's 2020 you know but i probably would have done the ultimate and 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 pulled the trigger when that glock was in my mouth and because of benghazi i Put the mm. gun down, reconciled with my wife, and here I back in remarried with her, and oh, we got three wonderful children. And here I'm talking to you, and life is gravy. I mean, it is. It really is gravy. So I think anything that you go that's bad in life that you feel like, man, this obstacle I'm going through, get through it. Because once you get through it, it just makes you stronger. And if you're faced with another a piece of adversity or obstacle again, you can overcome it. You're going to be able to overcome it because you already did it before. So that's 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 the lesson that. I hope people take from Benghazi, not the politics or anything, just that you can overcome anything that you want to, as long as said, you want to overcome it. That's that's uh, to me, that's it in a nutshell. Oh my God, dude. I tell you what, if this, if this mic right here wasn't fixed on, I would just like mic drop right now. Cause that was just delivered <laughs> perfectly. But dude, I, look, I just want to say, man, um, I find, I find it to be one of the most ironically, incredible things what you've just said because it's amazing when you look at it for example you look at Benghazi and you see just how bad that was just how traumatic it was the lives lost and just that experience it's such a negative thing but to be able to turn that around into something to turn that negative into something so inspiring to so many people is like laughing in adversity's face you know my best friend right now she has cancer and she is a a, she's a personal trainer and she just inspires the hell out of everyone like you would never know she was going through that but she just is an absolute inspiration to all of her clients and it just it's incredible how you can have something that's so horrible and so negative and if you can just flip that on itself and actually say, no, fuck you, you are yeah. not going to do this. I'm going to turn true. you into a positive. Is that not just, is that not just incredible to be able to do that? Uh, it, it's for those, those are the kind of people that honestly inspire me. I, I've been very blessed. I've been able to get my, my Crohn's disease under control. So I, you know, I, I understand health issues and and where it can just drag your drag you down and especially you know i've had a lot of friends with cancer as well and 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 for them every one of them has been screw this then if i got this i'm not gonna let it beat me i'm gonna live you know i'm gonna live like there's no tomorrow which is spot on what they do but that's inspirational it's like why am i complaining about these little alleys or that i got to get up earlier that maybe i get stuck in traffic for an hour holy shit (laughs) this person is fighting a debilitating disease and they're yeah. kicking its ass. And so that's, well, that's why also to me, Benghazi was like, well, let's turn this into positive. Why doesn't stop letting the politicians make it negative, start feeding into those manipulations and, and make it into a, into a negative. Cause it's not, it's heroism. I got to witness heroism firsthand. I got to see Ty- Tyrone was incredible. I mean, the man, he was our medic. He was a fighter. He was our leader. He was wow. running around fighting and then he'd come tape everybody up and then he'd make sure we were all, you know, everybody's ready. Everybody's on point on, on our communication and, and Bub who got a plane to us when nobody else would come to us. And then he was the only one that came up to the roof to help us support us that night. When all the rest of the guys that came in, including mm-hmm. the two Delta guys went into the building to me, that's like, Holy gosh, I, you know, I, they don't want me to just get into politics. Why am I talking about politics with this big guy? Let's talk about 
those two. Let's talk about what they did because they inspire me to get up every day and live the best life I can be. And, and I know, but we're going long and I'm sorry, but, but, uh, but uh, Benghazi was the, one of the greatest nights of my life. And Benghazi is not about politics. It's about heroism. It's about over again, adversity, overcoming adversity. It's about leadership. It's about courage. And it should inspire people to live their best life because you just, you don't know when it's going to end. So get out your ass up in the morning and go kick the day's ass every day. <laughs> It's what you want to do because that's what that's what Tyrone and Bub would be doing right now. And that's what I try to do, even though I'm getting old and I have my days where I need a nap every once in a while. But that other than that, I try to kick the day's ass as much as I can. <laughs> Man, uh, I got nothing more to add to that. That's perfect. That's just a great way to to round that off, dude. You know. Thanks, Luke. Just great stuff. <laughs> great stuff, man. Um, look, shameless plug. I've 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 honestly that is just the cherry on the icing for this podcast. That was a great end. I love it, man. Just shameless plug away pages, sure. <laughs> book, website, everything. Where can we find more of you, dude? Wow. You know, I, I have my own podcast called battle line podcast, which is, we talked to, we talked actually to a lot of rock rock singers, uh, but, uh, uh, but we also a lot of military veterans. Um, so it, it, I love it. it. It, we try to get away from the, Drum, drum, the, the drama that we have here in the United States, we don't get into it unless the per- guest wants to get into it. But it, it is, it's 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 stories of heroism that we try to get on. I got Chris Dutch Moyer, former Delta operator that's on after we get off this, I'm going to have him on the show. Um, tremendous guy in itself, a tremendous operator in his own right. But uh, have the podcast, I have my training company, Battleline Tactical, but you got to come down and train with us, buddy. If you ever get in Kansas, you come and train, man, we'll go shoot. And then, yeah, you know, pages, Chris Tano, Pirano, you search it and it pops up. But, buddy, I'm not a merchandise guy. I have books. I have merchandise. Hey, it's there because people ask for it. But, man, money's tight here, especially in America. You spend your money wisely. You spend it on room and board and food and on yourself, not <laughs> on my gear, unless you got a little bit extra. Oh, man, I love it. And, yeah, all I can say, dude, is see you at the range. Last little question, yeah. man. Uh can I get an authentic and original shaka? <laughs> yeah, and that did happen. That was what I, I love did, it. man. Dude, it was, yeah, I, I didn't have nowhere else to contact those dudes, and that's the only way I could do it. I, I still remember that dude chewing cot. I swear he had four teeth. Oh and God. I went like this to him with that 50 cal that dish could point at my forehead. <laughs> and when they smiled at me, but yeah, I, I was the most beautiful smile I had ever seen in my life. That toothless, cot filled poop grin. So, man, <laughs> Shaka Jumbo. If you if you're in Swahili, man, if, if the Swahili Jumbo, that's what it was right there. Right, mine from one to ten, dude. <laughs> that is outstanding, man. <laughs> yeah, man, I love it. Oh, dude, Chris, honestly, man, I just an absolute pleasure and a true honor having you on the show today, man. Just all I can say is thank you, and I just can't wait for people to listen to this, man. Thanks, Louie. I appreciate it. And and you got my email, I'll, my cell. I'll get you my cell on there. Um, I, I love promoting it out. You just tell me what you want me to do. I, or if you don't want me to, I don't have to either. I I, I just I want to help you out as best I can. So you just tell me what you, what you want me to do with it with uh, when you have the link or how does it work? Does it come out now or what you want me to do? Um, it's so it'll come out in yeah a couple, like next couple of days or something, man, okay. and uh, and we'll we'll shove it out to everyone who fancies having a listen because this is truly one of the best podcasts I think I've ever recorded on the show, and wow, you know I I just uh, this has been incredible, and people people need to hear this. It's 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 big stuff, man. It really is. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. You holler at me anything else, or if you ever in need of a guest, I'm. I'm here for you, bud, ever, ever yeah. again. So thanks, You're man. And again, it's, it's open. You come to Kansas, we'll go shoot. Let's do it, man. It's on. And um, well, guys, all I can just say is I hope you enjoyed that. It, it was just fantastic. Episode 86. We're rocketing through to 100 episodes. I'm loving it. We've got insane guests lined up. You know, it's wild at the moment. And um, guys, you know, great past episodes too. go and check them out. There's loads of them. I can recommend a few. They'll be in the description. Um, but yeah, guys, just do me the favor. Just leave a like, subscribe. There's more stuff coming. It's going to be epic. And um, I can't wait to see you guys back for the next episode. So guys, fights on and see you next time. Cheers.